Well, okay. Mm hmm. Yep. You know, when you sit at a desk all day like I do, I mean, I do shoot things every once in a while, but you know, the reality of my life at this point is that I spend a lot of time at this computer, and that's why it's a standing desk. Sometimes I'm standing, sometimes I'm sitting. A lot of the times I'm sitting, so that's why I have this Herman Miller chair. But I don't know if you guys, you guys tell me if you have any, like, you know, fancy chairs like this. I spent the, I invested the money so that my back wouldn't kill, and I still don't know what I'm doing with it. Um, so, yeah. So, but welcome to Cinematography Database Show. My name, hello, is Matt Workman, and today we're going to break down the cinematography of Straight Outta Compton, a uh, really, really fun movie. Oh my god, this movie it was a lot of fun. It was shot by DP, uh, Maddie, Matthew, Matt, Libertique. Um, Brooklyn native, I think. Uh, I feel like a lot of my crew in New York say that they've um, either worked with him or they've seen him walking around Brooklyn. That's cool. I would I would fanboy out probably. Um, and, you know, Matt, Maddie's work, Matt Libertique's work is... Uh, I know him from... Not Life of Pi, uh, just Pi. It's been a while. It's a black and white movie with Darren Aronofsky. I think that they met each other at AFI, like a lot of the people I've interviewed in the past. A lot of AFI power duos coming out. Um, Darren and Matt met at AFI. And then they did, um, you know, a whole bunch of other cool movies after that. Like, I think the late, well, the latest is Black Swan, right? Really interesting movies, I would say that. You know, just really cool stuff. And this movie, uh, fun story behind is that I, I, I read this on the ICG Magazine website is that, you know, Matt Liberty got the wind of this project, I think, by watching something on TV. Someone announced it. Um, and it turned out that the director and he, uh, F. Gary Gray, are on the same agency. And I don't know what agency that is. I would guess that because they rep above the line, like directors, it's probably um, something like William Morris Endeavor, I would guess, is where they're both signed. Not positive. I could, I'd have to look it up. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about agents at the end of this video. So let's get right into it. The cinematography of Straight Outta Compton. I didn't make an intro yet. I'm sorry, I didn't make an intro. But I will soon, I probably I'm gonna make one soon. Yeah, okay, so here we are. The cinematography of Straight Outta Compton, shot by DP Matthew Libatique. So before we get right into it, uh, I'm going to answer a question and clear something up. Uh, and this is something I'm going to try to do at the beginning of the shows from now on when there are questions that are that warrant it. You know, uh, Patrick Golan asks, "Can you clarify the mercury vapor, sodium vapor, metal halide confusion?" And this was during the um, the commercial for Porsche, where I tried to be all knowledgeable and drop these um, these science terms on everybody. And I completely jumbled it. Because you know why? Because like I've said before, I only shoot stage commercials. So these are things that you deal with in the real world. I'm afraid of the real world. I don't like the, I don't like the real world. I like to create things from scratch. Um, but I wanted to clear this up because I tried to explain it and I think I did a bad job and I think I, I confused people. So hopefully Patrick and anybody else that was confused by this, uh, hopefully this clears it up right now. So what we have here is... Uh, an orange street light and depending on where you are in the world and what time you're watching this video you know um this is pretty representative of what a city or suburban area looks like at night it has this orange cast at least you know i think it was kind of an older thing maybe like i should have done the research the 70s and 80s i think sodium vapor was really big um it's more efficient than tungsten and um, there's there's something about this red color. I think that the scientists and engineers thought that back in the day that this color red that was actually below the color temperature of tungsten was actually less tiring for your eyes to see. So you would have it on the streets at night and it wouldn't fatigue your eyes by looking at it. Now, the, the, the scientific community has moved on since that theory, but that's what I was told about sodium vapor. So sodium vapor, as far as an artistic thing um is that it's orange and this movie is all about sodium vapor and being orange at least in the beginning so that's why i thought it was relevant to bring up and actually answer this question because it relates to this and i think it's going to relate to a lot of movies so as we're approaching lighting cities nights um sodium vapor is that orange kind of like retro look honestly like it's not really like that anymore it's been replaced with stuff more like this which is blue and this is mercury vapor and i get these two mixed up like crazy you know it's like Sodium vapor, it doesn't mean anything to me. Mercury vapor, 
also doesn't mean anything to me other than mercury vapor is blue sodium vapor is is orange and i'm trying to think of a way to remember this like sodium i got no i have no associations with the word sodium i feel like my sodium's high or something like i don't like i have to take like pepsid ac for sodium i'm not sure mercury is a planet so space, I could I could probably remember that. Mercury, it's like the planet one. It's blue because it's like space. That's all I got for you. But um, however you guys remember it, because I'm going to always forget it, uh, like you can keep reminding me, is that mercury vapor is blue and sodium vapor is orange. And it's kind of interesting because New York City has gone through a similar thing where I think a lot of the lights were this orange for a while, this sodium vapor look. Um, actually, I know they were because we have special sodium vapor boxes we use on set that you kind of hang under street lights cuz they and they make basically more powerful street lights. We don't really have to do that anymore with the high sensitivity high sensitivity cameras, but we used to have to boost that light level cuz it wasn't enough. Now it's like too much light. But um New York City went through this transition where we're going from all sodium vapor to all LED, which is going to be daylight as well, similar to this mercury vapor look. That's important moving into this because Matt Libatique, I'm not going to talk about the lighting a ton, um but he talks about how he basically didn't use a key light and he wasn't going for this beauty thing. He was going for realistic. He wanted it to feel real and authentic to the time. And so he lets a lot of sodium vapor just hit people in the face. And it's not a great thing as far as beauty. It feels real. It feels really raw. It feels really cool. Um, but yeah, uh, what I'll say as I'm leaving this slide is that this movie is about Dr. Dre and kind of how he came up. Uh, and I found it fascinating. I'm, I'm going to go watch this movie again. And we're going to take a tea break in the middle and talk about it. But I'm going to go watch this entire movie again. And I don't do that for a lot of movies. Um, but what I would say is that this movie goes from this kind of like sodium vapor look here. Let's switch to the one that we can draw on. And it's a very, I would call this movie like very sodium vapor. That's how I think of like the intro and like the really powerful parts. Um, and then funny enough, like at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, sorry. So ear, earmuffs if you don't want spoilers. Um, at the end of the movie, you know, he talks about starting Aftermath. And Aftermath, I hope you know, we all know hopefully that that's, I don't know if you have to know this, but, um, you know, Eminem came from Shady Aftermath, uh, Dr. Dre and Eminem. And so the movie they go watch right after this is, of course, 8 Mile uh, about Eminem and how he came up. So right after this movie where Dre starts his own thing, go check out 8 Mile right after. Another really kind of fun movie. I like music movies, man. I came from music videos. I like them. Um, and it was shot by Rodrigo Prieto, 8 Mile. And 8 Mile is all about this. All about this blue. Eight Mile is just like all blue night exteriors, mercury vapor in Detroit. Hey man, I guess Compton was sodium vapor and Detroit is mercury vapor. That was a lot of talk for this slide. Okay, here we are. Um, here's our slate straight out of Compton. I don't know what that font is. That font's like typewriter font or something. We have director F. Gary Gray, uh, big music video director, done a bunch of movies as well, and Matt Libatique, ASC. Uh, we talked about him a little bit already. Cool people. Uh, but uh, this was shot in the Red Dragon, and there's not, not a lot to talk about here, but I, I guess there is. So we have sh shooting 6K, and we'll talk about the lenses in a second, but right here, clearly a spherical capture, full aperture of the of the Dragon 6K, but with a, 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 a mask here. They're going to crop out this top and bottom for a 240 delivery, low red code com compression, and this stuff is all depends on the scene. Um, but moving next, uh, I, again, this is a lot of this info is from the ICG article, which I should probably link to, but go check it out. ICG mag 600.com or something like that. You'll find it. Um, there's not a lot of quality websites about cinematography. Um, they talked about how, uh, Matt shot with, let's write it out now. Low mo. Oh no. We're going to have to undo, undo, undo. Forget that that happened. Kawa. My bad. These are Kawa anamorphics, and I think Kawa are Japanese anamorphic lenses, and they're uh, two times anamorphic lenses. We're not going to get fully into a breakdown of what anamorphic means and kind of what it looks like. Um, that every, Everyone's so into it that you guys probably know already, but I'll do something a little bit more put together on that, but just know Kawa anamorphics. Um, he talks about kind of like dirtying it up and making like the digital image a little bit more real. A lot of DPs talk about that. Uh, Kawas and flaring it. A lot of flares in this movie. A lot of flares when like the flow happens, when they start like really getting into the music. And uh, it's also used kind of like as a transition technique in the movie. So Kawa's flare great. And then, I, you know, I, the majority of the movie, likely um, they talk about were shot with Zeiss super speeds. Oh, nope, that's where my, that's where my image is down there. You know, Zeiss. 
super say super speeds um t13 flare really nicely um I, I saw a headline recently on facebook that people are like stripping the coats off of the front and backs that's cool um you know even more flare and if that's what's going to get the lenses off of the rental floor then you know all the power to you to kind of like ruin your um you know to kind of ruin your lenses and i'm not sure i want people stripping coats off of my super speeds um so like I said, I'm not going to talk about the lighting like a super ton in this one um, because Matt talks about how he just kept it natural. And there's a lot of natural light. And there's there's something to be said about that, but it's not something that I really want to get into uh, right now. What I am going to do is basically break down the camera movement. So this video is going to be like a master class on the different ways of moving the camera, the different tools you need to move the camera, and then looking at some of the shots and maybe like, why you would use those things and that he basically touches on like everything like literally everything i've not used all the toys that he's played with on this movie and uh we'll break down it's kind of a fun thing to go through and do that i think i'm having fun doing it um so let's start with the basic the basic is just handheld handheld so here's matt libatique here's his operator i know all their names i just i should have i need like a little place to keep references so i can be like like a cheat sheet maybe i'll set up my ipad next time so i can nail those references seamlessly but not this time. Uh, Matt Libatique over here operating. He's got a shoulder pad on. And the other operator, you'll look that they're both grabbing the map box slash the rails. I think Matt might have handles. But this is like the raw, most raw way of going handled with a camera. And it feels raw. Okay. Uh, I had a big Facebook discussion debate um, with a bunch of operators and DPs. Like, what's the realest way of moving the camera? And it doesn't really make sense to even approach it like that. But... When you, when you hold it raw like this, just on your shoulder and with your hands, there's all this like off axis stuff happening and you feel the steps and that's part of it. And in this scene, it's kind of a violent um, contention point where the police are kind of harassing uh, NWA and the camera work supports that. It's this really raw, rough feel and they kind of go with that. Um, and it's just a shoulder pad and grabbing the map box or maybe like a little bit of a rail. Uh, the next thing, we'll look at handled here. Here's Matt handled again. And I want to call it down here. This is called a cine saddle. And it's basically just a big pillow that you put in your lap or between your arms. And I've used it, or you put it under your shoulder. There's a mini one. I used to own one. I think I got stolen on a commercial once or I lost it. Um, and it's just a big pillow, but with a strap. And it's it's really rough. It's not going to break. You can get wet. It's expensive pillow. Um, I bought mine from Abelson in New York, um, but I loved it. When I was doing handheld, that big pillow, you start to fit, find places to just rest your arms on it and do that stuff. It's a little bit more smoother and it's a little bit for like a longer term shot. Like I used to do content where we're like, I would go without with like a Sony F3, remember that camera? Uh, and an Optimo, like a 30 to 80. And I would just sit there all day filming people like had to sit there all day. So you start to like any little thing when you're filming for that long handheld, any little thing of comfort will save your back in your arms and make the, the image better because you're not going to be like passed out tired. Um, so this moves us to our next type of handheld, which is the easy rig. And we talked about the easy rig before, right? Um, it basically, again, really great for um, shooting long takes. And that's what I used to use it for. But it's also good for dynamic height changes. And in this behind the scenes video, you see Matt going up and down on the uh, on the easy rig and using it for that. It kind of takes the weight off of you. And then he's got this front handle here to help grab the, you know, that. It's kind of like grabbing the map box because you're holding it by like the front and you can kind of rotate it like this. Uh, but you're not actually grabbing the map box because that, you know, you might you might break the map box. You might be tweaking the filter. You might be doing something funny. These look like Kawas. Though I can't tell because they're kind of long, you know? Hard to say. Uh, <laughs> Eric here is yelling. <laughs> it's a funny still. Uh, it's funny still. Uh, here's another great, great high res now all of a sudden the quality is higher right uh we can really see the red camera we can see this uh, inverted handle grip style operating with the easy rig man when the easy rig first came out it was called the humiliator man that's what D i used to get so much shit for wearing the the easy rig and i'm like a little guy relative to like i feel like the the camera industry in the states and like we were holding like when i was getting into this type of content i was shooting with f3s with optimos that's heavy and we'd be like in miami shooting commercials and running around. I was like, this is heavy. So I started using the easy rigs and people used to make fun of me for it. Um, but look at the easy rig now. I mean, I forget the guy's name that makes that company. So many easy rigs on set, man, everywhere. Like 
But anyway, here's the easy rig. Matt Libatik uses it. I feel vindicated that I used to use it too. Um, and then here's another great still. These nice stills came from uh, the uh, International Cinematographers Guild website. Go check them out. And they credit the, the set photographer who took these. Again, that kind of like cool operating style. A little bit better for long takes. You can get lower angles. We could dig into some of the lighting in the scene, but I'm going to try to not get onto that. We're going to try to stick with the uh, with the camera movement. So kind of moving up the, the food chain as far as like um, camera movement. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of gimbal stuff. I mean, I think if you guys watched or followed anything about this movie, there's a lot of gimbal work in it, like really cool gimbal work. Uh, the whole movie is kind of kind of based on using gimbals, I think, as far as like the technique and Matt kind of admits to that. Uh, this is a really intense scene, and they're using Steadicam, clearly. And what I would say as I move on to this next slide is that what I've noticed uh, for myself, having worked with Steadicam and, and gimbals, and then I see out in the world more and more uh combinations of both like he could have used a, a movie a, um, a movie for this but why do you use a steady cam instead for me the steady cam what i've noticed is about shooting faces when you're shooting people's faces like medium close-ups and close-ups the steady cam is is perhaps a better tool you can get higher up to people a little bit easier and it's a little bit more stable that doesn't make a lot of sense but like to me it's a little bit more like you don't feel the steps of the operator as much of their arms. So when you're concentrating on faces where like little changes like that would be really distracting, I think Steadicam is the way to go. And the, the time that you go for the Movi is when you're shooting wide shots. I think that's where Movi really, or any gimbal, really shines, really wide shots where you need to do interesting uh, moves. And we're going to be looking at some interesting moves right now. Oh, um, so we're going to do this breakdown. We're gonna do this first move, and then we're gonna take a break. We're gonna we're gonna just. I know these videos get long. We're gonna take a breather. So, but I'm gonna start off with this really cool one. So here's a, a behind the scenes that I'm gonna show you step by step what's going on. So we have our movie operator here, and we have Eric who just ran through the scene, uh, and I think a dog's like where the camera's supposed to be. He's like oh, and he's like running. So um, we see him run, and the movie operator follows him follows him we see eric starts to like run up here run up onto the roof and uh he's climbing the roof and then we see our i think this is a i think the combo team for this set and if you're on like a union movie um it's kind of like the a operator slash steady cam operator and the key grip also kind of gets in on the action um so we see a handoff so he's passing the movie up onto the roof now it's on the roof that's cool right and so i think their key grip hands it off to another operator and we keep following him. So that's a cool use of the of the movie. I mean, that's kind of like in the advertising. And I think when a lot of people start to like wrap their heads around, like, why do I use this tool? That's why. I mean, that's really unique. And that's like a really, really cool way of uh, moving the camera. Something you really can't do almost any other way. You couldn't really do that with a steady cam because he got through that little space. So I'm going to leave you here at this, um, this frame. This is what we're going to break down next. But we're going to take a little tea break, right? Little tea break. So everyone just take a break here. I have my tea. You guys let me know if this is obnoxious or not. Uh, but sometimes I feel like I'm making more mistakes and uh, just gotta gotta chill it out. So uh, real talk, I watched this movie last night in bed with my wife and um, she fell asleep in the middle of it. So we're gonna go watch it again because uh, she's interested in how it ended. But, you know, we got two kids. It's been a long day. But I wanted to get this movie in so I could do the breakdown today. And it's it's just such an interesting movie. And I, I liken this to um, that thing you do with Tom Hanks, 8 Mile, Hustle and Flow, just the music industry and the movie industry. It's just like, I love that. It's really cool, you know. Um, maybe that's something I want to, I don't know. I, I probably... Doing movies is a long-term battle. It's it's such a it's such a long game to get into them, and then even when you like make it, it's still just like quite a quite a project. And what I've learned from Matt Libatique and DPs over and over again is like it never gets easier. It's always this terrific battle and journey. And some people live for that, other people don't. Um, but yeah, I was watching this movie with my wife last night, and she works in the music industry. Uh, if you go check out her website, which is dianalevine.com, she shot every relevant musician in the last like. I would say like the last five years to five years back from that, 
she we were in New York and she was shooting every musician there there was and she's been on tour with like new kids on the block um when they came back and she's been in like you know Miami, Vegas, LA like traveled everywhere to shoot these musicians. She's been to the Super Bowl with Will I Am. So she knows this life and it's so interesting to see a movie about it. And I lived this a little bit uh early part of my career. Actually the the scenes that are in the in the booth where they're filming them um performing. I've shot so many music videos and recording booths like that. I was like all the studios in New York City I've shot in. I've shot 50 Cent and Ludacris, all those guys in those booths. And the lighting for that, just it just really reminded me of that. And I, I, I kind of forget about this phase of my career where I was working with, um, working on this kind of project, you know, the hip hop and like the new artists. And um, it was kind of wild and crazy, even for me as a DP. It's like, I didn't really know the rules. I wasn't in, in the industry at the time. I was just shooting stuff and got lucky enough to work for some some directors with some big artists, and uh, this movie is just a, is a cool throwback, you know. Uh, okay, well, here we are. Sorry for the gross drinking sounds. Uh, yeah, tea break. Tea break over. Okay, game on. We're going to keep going. So this is cool. So we have the – there's two parts that are cool here. You're looking at this. You're like, oh, I kind of get it. Well, just, just wait. Just wait. Um, so we have the movie here, and we have them holding <laughs> this speed row with this clamp on it. This clamp is interesting. I think this is a thing now that you can buy, and I'll show you what it is in a second. Um, so they're both walking with the movie, so you get that. And this is like that iconic follow behind NWA as they go to their first show, I think. Um, so we see that they're fo we're following all four of them. Uh, it takes two guys. How many grips does it take to carry a movie to? Um, uh, and they're walking. And I think what's going to happen here is um, I think they end up going over a car with it or something so it's like why is there like this big space underneath or no maybe they don't they don't they're just actually walking with it um but you can see this guy who's this guy he's kind of sneaking up he looks like he's gonna come steal the camera and he kind of does so it, it gets a little obscured um oh does it not show it no 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 oh, sorry. so we're, i think they went over a car right so there's this t-bone they go over something or over people or something like that so kind of a technocrane move where you're going over objects that you normally couldn't and then the operator comes in and he actually grabs the uh he actually grabs the camera off of this rig and there's this latch that releases it um so it goes from this like kind of cool techno crane shot floating over stuff to a handoff again where uh the operator grabs it and then walks off up the stairs so really cool it's like a techno crane into uh into a steady cam shot and again it's not about faces it's kind of a wide shot really good stuff for gimbals. That's how I think about it. I might be wrong. Um, I know a lot of professional gimbal operators are at this point, but that's where I start to see it as a DP, where like I have to kind of make that decision. When do we use what tool? What days do we schedule it? That's what I would start to put together as a rule. Gimbals, wide shots, steady cam close-ups. Not every budget's going to be able to handle that. And uh, yeah, so like I have this chair, like I was saying in the beginning, like I have this ergonomic chair and then I just end up sitting like crazy. I don't know what to do about this. Um, another cool shot. So clearly we have our jib here. I forget what this model jib is. I, Roger Deakins key grip uses it a lot. I actually have the paperwork for it. I've, I hacked out the dimensions. I found some paperwork, which is really hard to find dimensions in CAD drawings of film equipment. They're usually a little bit like, not hidden, but it's not really out there that much. But So we have this jib that's sectional. You can build it as long as you want. Uh, a lot of key grips use it. Then we have this definitely... Um, hacked together in a good way, you know, key grips make rigs, hacking's maybe not the word for it, but at the end of it, clearly there's this movie, so they're kind of jibbing it in, they swing it in, and then guess what happens? You can probably guess at this point. Um, the operator comes in and just grabs it, and it just slides right off the rig, so it jibs in, and then he transitions it into a wraparound shot. Um, pretty awesome. Pretty cool. This is some real gimbal porn going on today. Um, but it's it's I, it's the first movie that I've broken down and really looked at that has effective gimbal um, cam work in it. But he also mixes like handheld, easy rig, steady cam, and you'll see coming up even more stuff. So pretty pretty cool. This is the first movie I've seen with gimbal in it. I would say. Um, <clears throat> getting into some bigger stuff here again, not technically a techno crane, but we can just call it a techno crane if you want. Uh, this does telescope out. Um, and they show that in the behind the scenes video, but what I want to call attention to is this is called a Leonard Chapman, which is the company hydroscope. 
Uh, and you use this techno crane because it can go underwater. The whole crane is waterproof and it can go underwater. So if you want underwater techno crane shots, let that sit in underwater techno crane shots. If that's what the director's asking for, uh, you better you better g give the producer the sad news that you need um, pretty expensive toy on set. So Leonard Chapman, Hydroscope, wanted to give Leonard Chapman a little bit of love. See you guys on Instagram. You guys make really cool dollies. A lot of key grips in LA love the uh, the Chapman Leonard. So we see that the camera is under this underwater casing, and then this um, hydraulic based uh, techno crane situation can go underwater and then why would you want to do that here is the shot so all splashy water you can see the water horizon is right here um and it started below and the camera is moving up to get this shot so if you're shooting a pool party <laughs> like this scene i've shot so many music videos that look like this um dealing with pools where you have to gfci all the lights and then people getting people getting wild around camera. That's that was the goal. Uh, this this whole thing is just bringing back memories to like Vegas and, and all that stuff. And if if any of my LA crew who've worked with me on those videos are watching this, then you guys or New York crew, you guys you guys know what this is. Um, we never had the hydroscope, but you can basically go from underwater to above water. Um, and there's really no other way of doing that like effectively and quickly. And then this shot comes from out of the water and then telescopes all the way in to uh, up here. I don't know if this shot actually makes the video, but it's definitely in the trailer. Um, as far as getting some like, you know, sex appeal into the trailer, this this was this was definitely from that. That's where I took this still from was the trailer. I don't remember seeing this scene in the movie. Maybe it's like a quick montage, but I don't remember this whole shot uh, doing that. So this brings us to our last shot. Uh, of this whole movie that I'm going to break down today. And this is called a spider cam. And this is becoming more relevant. And as we move on to like productions these days, I would say, I'm starting to understand why you use this sort of thing more and more. Uh, and this kind of replaces a drone because it's a lot more uh, repeatable. It's a lot safer. I would say when you're getting this close to people, but this is called a spider cam. And I might be spelling this wrong. I think it's like this. That's a D. Spider cam. Um, it's not a cable cam. A cable cam goes in one straight line, and we'll break down some cable cam shots probably in another movie or commercials. They're huge in commercials right now. I see cable cams on every commercial, not every, but a lot. So this has basically four towers. So picture these towers. These towers are hundreds of feet tall. Pure engineering going on here, rigging engineering. This is not like normal movie making shit. Um, big towers in the back, like hundreds of feet tall, and they have these cables that go down to it. And these cables are coming in and out of these boxes. And basically with that, they can move the camera anywhere within a volume. Um, so area is 2D, volume is 3D. So a cube is a volume. Picture like a big cube, a big a big box that people are living in. That's what I, when, when I say a volume, that's what it means. So within the volume created with this, um, between these four columns, this camera can move literally anywhere in there. Uh, it's all done with the computer. Previs comes in really handy when you're trying to do this kind of stuff, but I'll show you what kind of shots can be done with this that would be rather difficult slash impossible any other way. And then here we are with our round circular stabilized head, everybody. What is that? What is that stabilized head called? It's called a Libra head. Um, and yeah, definitely a lot of Libra head plus spider cam stuff happening. I've seen that on a lot of commercials. And if I'm ever in a position to need this type of rig, spider cam Libra head. Just do it. That's what it works. That's what the pros use. Now you guys know, look like a boss and recommend that on your next shoot. Um, so here's an incredibly wide shot. And you'll, I'm just going to take you through what a spider cam shot looks like and why you need it. So we're flying in on him really quickly. And then we're like on stage with him. And then he throws up the bird. Not, a ve not very nice. Look at look at the lighting. They nailed it. They got the, the, they got the bird with the with the with the lighting right behind it. it's perfect so we're going behind him so this came from like way back like a super wide shot flew in went behind his head this thing is probably like right up right behind him so this, this is where it would be scary to use a drone you know because drones have helicopter blades and they have wind and you know it's there's things going on that you don't necessarily want the spider cam does that it goes back around him um and then i don't have the rest of the shot here but then it flies all the way back out to a wide shot that is a spider cam shot. That's why you need it. The stabilized head, you can um, operate 
without um, actually being on there, of course. And I think you can program it. I've heard that this is motion control. Oh, uh, you can do passes, but I think with wind and gravity, there's no way that you could align plates from it, but you can at least do a similar move. So you can program in this move and just do take after take after take and not have to hit these really fast, pretty incredible um, remote head operated moves. I think that would be incredibly difficult to do. That's a spider cam. And then here's just a cool still of NWA being NWA and doing cool stuff. So the cinematography of Straight Outta Compton, um, we kind of talked about, um, let's see if I can get this right, sodium vapor and mercury vapor. It's still hard for me. Um, and then we talked about handheld, easy rig, steady cam, Movi, hydroscope, spider cam. Uh, how many times have you heard all of those said in one sentence or in one video and broken down? So uh, that was our look at Straight Outta Compton. I love this movie, man. I just, it's so cool. Um, I love seeing it. I like want to see the sequel where Dr. Dre does uh, start Aftermath and how he finds 50 Cent in, in Eminem uh, in the same s style. I would love to see F. Gary Gray and Matt Libatique uh, just make another one of these. I think it's really cool. Um, so uh, this week, you know, like my next project with Cinematography Database, like I made Cine Designer 2D. And, you know, I really like that. And I think I can say it now is basically I've teamed up with um, Shane Hurlbut's team, Hurlbut Visuals, Shane's Inner Circle. Uh, go check out both of those things if you don't know what they are. Um, Shane's team is going to start to use it for their lighting diagrams and different things. So that's an exciting collaboration. And it's um, I'm starting to use it for my jobs, too, when I'm going to do just 2D. But I do 3D cine design, and I'm building a Cinema 4D plugin uh, that's basically like next level it's it's previs and tech viz if you know what that is for dps and directors so you have 3d models of cameras and the cranes and the jibs and the dollies so if you if you wonder why i know so much about this equipment it's because i've built it all in 3d and it actually moves the way that it does in the real world you can look through those you can build real camera moves and then you can also light on top of that so that's what i'm building in the background i've been building it for a while i'm um, bringing it to cinema 4d first because i think there's a lot more filmmakers but that's an accessible program and then also right now, what I'm going to start to do is the podcast this week, um, the next couple of podcasts, I'm actually interviewing colorists, which um, is really important. Um, I talked to a couple of really cool colorists that I know in New York and one in Boston. I won't spoil it just yet. Uh, and we talk about just like the business of being a colorist and the collaboration because coloring and DPing are like, you can't really do one without the other. They're just like permanently stuck together and will be forever moving forward and onset coloring and all that stuff it's good to know about color so if you're don't come from an industry or region that uses colorists um listen to the podcast this week and the next couple of weeks or i don't know how many um talking with colorists and then after that i'm going to start talking to dp agents so um if you're a dp and you're you're interested in agents um this is really your opportunity uh, to find out everything you ever wanted to know. Uh, it took me about eight years to get to the point where I had an agent. Um, and only really recently, uh, we moved to Gersh, which is one of the pretty big agency. You know, I'd say one of the one of the bigger ones. And I'm at the point now where, because of running Cinematography Database and being on an agency, uh, I can basically and have spoken to a lot of agents and I talked to a lot of DPs that have agents and I, I talked to them about how they got signed, why they went with certain agents. And I, I'm in the position where I know those answers now. And I've gone through the process of finding an agent. I've done it the wrong way and I've done it, I guess the right way. There's no right way. If you get an agent and it works out, that's great. But I've learned the different ways that DPs get agents, what agents think, when can you approach an agent? Do they approach you? How does the money work? How does the business work? Um, I remember not knowing that stuff and it being kind of like, there's just nothing on the internet about it, of course. There's, it's quite a secret box, it has been. Um, what I'm working on now is content to kind of open up that world. And I'm going to make uh, a lot of free stuff to first, you know, like the podcast. I'm going to interview a lot of agents and you're going to hear me ask them questions. Uh, a lot of them are community generated questions. I asked on Facebook and Twitter, what do you guys want to know about agents? And I have a big list and it probably is most of what everyone wants. And I'm going to ask them on the podcast and you can listen to that. And then I'll probably also do like a little wrap up uh, 
blog or wrap up video to kind of go over it, but I'm going to make a really in-depth course because there's a lot that goes into the, what, what, does, what does the industry mean? Uh, what does it mean to have an agent? What do they do? How do you get them? How do you make yourself basically presentable to an agent and to get to that level? And there's a lot of stuff there and it's going to probably be like multiple hours to get that all into writing and into a video. So I'm going to make that a, that a course and that's going to be a paid course. But a lot of the content is going to be on the podcast, on the blog. You'll get like a lot of the stuff. But if you want the in-depth stuff and the really like in-depth knowledge, that's going to be a course. Um, and that'll be available at the Cinematography Database online store. And, you know, again, this information, it doesn't exist in the world. And it's, it's, there's people that know it, but they don't have a platform to share it with people. And what, what I want to know now, and I asked on the newsletter, if you're not on the newsletter, go to cinematographydb.com, join the newsletter. Because that's where we talk. That's where I really like to talk to people, like, one-on-one. -on -one. Like, I do a lot of, like, one-on-one -on -one talking with people um, once we're on newsletter terms. Not so much on the YouTube stuff. I like that. But um, if you want talking, like, real career stuff, that usually happens on the newsletter for now. If you have questions about getting an agent, throw them into the comments here. Go on the newsletter and just email me. Let me know what you want to know about DP agents um, for the next, like, couple months. Or I'm not sure how long we're going to do this. I'm going to dig into it. I'm going to find out all the relevant information from agents that are working now, DPs that are working now. I'm going to gather all of it up and I'm going to package it. So if you have questions, you know, let me know. Because if I don't know the question, I may not ask it. You may not get the information at the end. And I don't know the next time that I'm going to spend this much time dedicated to agents because I have one. I, I kind of know this stuff already. I want to move on to doing more lighting technique stuff um, as far as like guides and courses. But for right now, because so many people ask me about it, um, I'm going to dedicate a lot of time to finding out and getting relevant, up-to-date information about DP agencies and how they work. Film festivals, conventions, internet emails, social media, all that stuff. We're going to dig so deep into it. Um, so let me know your comments on YouTube, on the newsletter. We're going to learn about DP agents together. Because uh, I know my experience, I know a lot of other DPs' experiences, but um, I'm interested to hear it from the agents themselves. And I think that you guys would be as well if you're looking to get agents uh, either in the U.S., if you're outside of the U.S. trying to get an agent uh, in America or in Europe. It's a, it's a complicated thing, and there's a lot of stuff to, to dig into. So let me know what you guys want to know. I know this got a little bit rambly at the end, and I kind of apologize again for the beginning. I feel kind of bad about that. But um, I will, uh, I'll see you guys on the next episode. Uh, hit the subscribe button on YouTube. Hit the like video button. And I'll see you on the next episode. I'll see you guys later. Bye.